Welcome. Welcome, everyone, to the law, your money, and you. I'm trying to look straight ahead, but I have to curve myself to look straight ahead. But it doesn't matter. You're welcome, and we welcome you to the law, your money, and you. This is our continuing series, as Camille will tell you, my co-host. Yes, and hello. Yes, this is our continuing series on the COVID-19 epidemic, a pandemic, and today we are very fortunate to have a visitor who has been with us more than once, um, most recently talking with us about the coronavirus that was sort of just getting off the ground at the time, and now we've been months into it, and Dr. Stephen Ross of Sharon is here to fill us in on the latest and greatest. Hello, Dr. Ross. Hi. Good evening, ladies. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, and I have to tell you, we're so excited to have you back because when you were on before, it was just starting and you were telling us about it, which very few people know. But now now it's like opened up and I don't know if there's any differences, but we'll leave it to you uh, to tell us, which we appreciate. I'll tell you, the, the reason I'm wearing the mask and the gloves today. I like the two different colors, by the way, of the gloves. Oh. Classy, very classy. Very yeah. observant. <laughs> it just shows. I mean, people are wearing these designer masks and everything. They're pretty nice, you know? Yeah. Some of the movie sets have sequins. Some of the people that come in with this, they have their works of art, actually. They're beautiful. Mm -hmm. So the reason I'm wearing the mask today is um, to emphasize the extreme infectivity of this virus. Uh, the COVID virus is much, much more infectious than um, the flu virus or, or almost any virus that we've seen. And I believe I talked to you last time that, first of all, when, when people come into our office, um, it, we tend to screen them over the phone to find out if they have any of the symptoms of the COVID, which, you know, as you remember, they're the fever, the cough, the shortness of breath, the chest pain, the fatigue muscle aches and pains, and, and especially when you lose the sense of smell. That's one of the, one of the key things. Um, and usually what we do is we'll send people down to get the COVID test and maybe a, a chest x-ray at the same time and possibly a blood test and we'll do you know, telehealth with them uh, mm -hmm. and, and treat them as best we can um, over the phone um, without having them come in the office unless they're COVID negative because it's so infectious. And that, and every time um, someone comes into our office, the first thing they do is they get a face mask and gloves. Because mm -hmm. we treat everybody as if they have COVID until proven otherwise. Um, so the story I had to tell was about this young gentleman who came in who didn't really have any of the, those symptoms that I mentioned to you and had what sounded like a sinus infection, but it wasn't getting better. So when I saw him back, this was in March, I was questioning him about his symptoms and he mentioned um, that one night he had chills. So I didn't think very much of it, but I said, eh, maybe I better send him for a COVID test. And to my surprise, he was positive. Mm -hmm. So here, here it is someone who had, you know, a little sinus infection, not, no one of the other symptoms, actually no symptoms other than the stuff he knows. And he was positive. So then I said, well, what am I going to do next? I said, well, I know he's got a wife and two daughters. And I said, the best thing is, even though none of them have symptoms, we better have them go and get some tests. So I sent them for tests, and they were all positive. Mm. None of them had symptoms. Mm. In retrospect, one of the daughters who, who, um, who was in their 20s, recall that she felt like she had a fever a week ago, but then it just went away. And um, so they were running around like um, 18 million other people that are asymptomatic, because now we know we got two and a half million who've had it, but they estimate that there's 10 times as many people that are asymptomatic that don't even know they have it. Right. And they're running around just infecting people. And... Of course, the thing that we know, I think everybody knows, that it is more uh, dangerous and a higher mortality rate for people who are older, especially over, over the age of 80, 
and who have comorbidity, uh, any diabetes or um, heart disease of any sort, um, the fatality rate is uh, probably, um, you know, these, these things are a compilation of a bunch of things that I've read, so none of, none of the numbers are exactly, you know, uh, pristine, but somewhere about 80%. So, you know, like eight out of 10 people over the age of 80 who get this, they're gone. Mm. And as you go down the scale of, of, of decades, you know, there are fewer and fewer people that, that, that there's a mortality. Um, but they are finding out now uh, that they started to open up and, and the young people where I go and I look around and they're, they're not social distancing and they're not wearing masks. Younger and younger people are getting these uh, infections. And some of them are up in the hospital. I'm sure you've heard of, well, let me back up a little bit. So the other SARS viruses, this is a, a, you know, a, a respiratory, acute respiratory virus that causes um, pneumonia and respiratory failure. And that's why people end up on ventilators. And hopefully you keep them alive long enough until their own immune response and reparative responses fight off the, um, the virus and they recover. And that's why younger people, when they get sick, they're not usually as sick and more of them recover if they're on a ventilator versus if they're older, only two out of 10 recover after two weeks on a ventilator, which mm -hmm. I think is, you know, the longest they tend to keep people on. Cause you uh, just Dr. Keep... Ross, can you explain to people to our viewers, what exactly does the ventilator do? All the ventilator does is pump oxygen into your lungs. So it keeps enough oxygen going around your body that, that you, your cells, your heart, your brain, everything can live. But that's all it is, just an oxygenating machine. Is that the same as a respirator? Well, sometimes they call, these little things that we're wearing are sometimes called respirators. So the proper term for the, for the, for the tubes that go in the lungs are the, the ventilators. Uh -huh. Now, when I was a kid way back, they had a disease called polio. I and they, did, they didn't have any of these ventilators. They had what they call, you remember the term iron lung? Yes, iron lung. And what they were basically were barrels where you had a head stick out and feet stick out. And then there was a pipe that was in that would push the air in and then a pipe that was on the other end that sucked the air out. And that's how they would breathe with positive pressure, negative pressure. It's a barrel. And There's a lot of people today who uh, had polio when they were kids and you, you'll see them in they have a limp or this or that, and, and you say they had, that's and how then, they had polio. And, and, and they, can have, they can have late complications. They can have recrudescence of the uh, neurological deficits uh, in late polio. There's a disease called late polio. Hmm. So hmm. getting back to the SARS, getting back to COVID, um, so it's extremely uh, infectious, and it's not just a respiratory killer, a lung killer. But they're finding out that there have been people who've gone to the hospital thinking that they were having a heart attack. And they would do a blood test to look for um, the protein called troponin that's released when you have a heart attack. And they found it. So they diagnosed a heart attack on these people. And they rushed them up to the, um, the cardiac cath unit to, you know, suck out the clot. And they cath, cath them. And they find out there's no clot. There's no blockage whatsoever. What it was is the... So the COVID virus attacking the heart, oh, muscle my. directly, called oh, my. myocarditis. Hmm. And also there are some people that are having strokes, and they go and they treat them like, you know, the, the, the current treatment of strokes is to get you to a tertiary hospital, get a, a cerebral angiogram, and then suck out the clot if there's a clot or put in a stent or something. And they were finding out that these people didn't have blockages either. So... Subsequently, the doctors were called pathologists that analyzed the origin of illnesses and the structure, uh, destruction of tissue uh, all around the world were doing, um, well, I don't like to use the word autopsies, but they would take parts of the bodies of people who had passed and analyze them under the microscope at different stains. And they were finding that this virus, not only does it attack the lungs primarily, but it attacks the heart, it attacks the brain, and it attacks the kidneys. And it also interferes with the coagulation of the body, so the clots form. Oh, boy. So that's why you've heard of the, the COVID feet, kids having blue, blue feet and blue toes. Yeah. That's probably because clots formed in the, in the, lower, in the extremities mm -hmm. of the feet or the hands. And that, that was just sort of a parting 
gesture from the uh, the virus. So mm -hmm. the virus is, is much more lethal and it does a lot a lot more to the body than you realize. And even some of the it's in some of the literature I read, even some and I don't mean to be um, an alarmist. I'm just trying to be scientific. But some of the literature that I read that is even in people who were supposedly asymptomatic have damage. If they look at them closely and check maybe their, 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 uh, their kidneys or their brain or their heart in some way, they're finding out that these people may have minimal damage that they don't even are aware has happened. Um, and the other research has shown that you don't have to worry if you're walking past someone on the sidewalk. You can't catch the virus just by passing somebody unless you happen to look at them and they cough in your face and you feel the, the stuff on your face and you have to like wipe it off. Mm -hmm. um, which if you're wearing a mask, and that sometimes does happen because one of my family members was in a, a store and a, a little child came up practically in her face and coughed in her face. Mm. But she was wearing a mask and you know, we told her she probably didn't have to worry about it. But um, if you're having a, a conversation with somebody who you think is asymptomatic, or they think that they don't have anything, and you're within about three or four feet and you spend 15 minutes with them, they can give you and pass on the germ to you. You don't have to be, the, the six feet thing is, is if someone sneezes or mildly or something to be away. But if you're, if you're close to three or four feet, like at a dinner table, then you can catch something from someone who's asymptomatic and doesn't even know they have it. So I think that's one of the reasons you're seeing the spikes right now, you know, in Texas and Florida and uh, California. Because mm -hmm. people are going out, especially young people who feel like they don't have anything to lose because they're not going to end up in ventilators. Some of them might end up in the hospital just to get uh, nasal oxygen. You know, you sit there and they put the thing in your nose. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because you want to keep the, um, what, what you would call the percentage oxygen carried by your blood uh, above, say, 90%. Mm -hmm. Like you and I, if you came into my office and I put the thing in your finger, usually it's going to read 90% if you have normal lungs and everything. But if you get pneumonia or the COVID thing, that could drop into the 80s. And when it drops into the 80s, that's dangerous for the heart. And the, you know, the heart can stop or, or the brain can get damaged. So mm -hmm. that's the that they, they give you, the, they put you on the ventilator or they give you the nasal oxygen. So if they give you the nasal oxygen first and you keep going down, 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 you don't do saturates and you start to feel loopy, then they say, okay, we're going to put you on the ventilator. And then when they do that, they have to sedate you. So, you know, who's going to, you know, who's going to be sitting around with a giant tube going into the lungs. So they have to give you uh, tranquilizers and, and morphine type of things to keep mm. you quiet while um, you get oxygenated and hopefully you recover. Mm. Is it easy to confuse these symptoms with another disease or that you could have two things and they treating you just for one? Well, the respiratory thing, you, know, you could have regular, is regular pneumonia, but regular pneumonia only goes to, there's about five, five different lobes of the lung. And regular pneumonia just usually infects one lobe. But a virus will infect multiple lobes. And, and the COVID virus, you, you know, one of the things you can diagnose it on a chest X-ray or a CAT scan, mm. because you might see all five lobes, you know, infected with little, little white, Bursts of like like a star burst in, in there when, when you look at it in the x-ray and that's an indication that it's affecting all the different lobes and you know that's why it's, it's a major insult on the uh, the lungs but I think oh, last time last I'm time sorry. We, Go ahead. Yeah, well last time we did talk about the fact that one of the reasons that people don't survive is they have an overreactive immunity remember that I talked about the the kinin storm or, that I think you might have heard on television when some of the pundits talk about the overreaction of the immunity and you get increased permeability of the, the blood vessels and the lungs flood with fluid in addition to having you know, the pus from the, uh, the virus. And that, that seems to be worse than the fatality. Mm. There was just one study that was shown that using a, um, a steroid called Decadron, uh, in improved, uh, decreased the mortality by a third of people mm -hmm. who are oh, yeah. severely sick. And then what, the, what that does is it, it decreases inflammation and permeability of the blood vessels so that people don't drown in their own serum. Mm -hmm. 
Right. But hey, doctor, still, doctor, yeah. at, the, at the, the beginning, this was just coming out. Now we're at a stage where they're letting um, places open up. Uh, they're talking about the kids going back to school. Well, what's, what's your opinion on that? I mean, they got to get back to, what is it? They, they, they have to, if they have a cure, but staying home might be worse than not mixing in there. I mean, is there any like uh, things uh, you can say to people, like make sure you and the masks do good, the gloves. Do you need the gloves? Do you need the? the thing about in the, in the colleges and in the schools is um, they're trying to put together what they call a hybrid program of online and in-class instruction, because in class you still have to maintain the six foot distance between desks or chairs and of course the classrooms weren't made to that way to have a full class with that kind of distancing so you know the class sizes might only be a, a third or a quarter of the size that they normally are which means that they may have to stagger some of the classes uh, with um, in-class study and some classes with home study online and then stagger the uh, classes so that um, you know you have uh, more more, cl more more classes with fewer students um, so they seem to be that seems to be the program that in both the colleges and the, the high schools at least are looking at and the thing is with, the, with, the, with even in that population you don't usually have to worry about a high percentage of mortality or, or illness because they're not quite as susceptible to getting the illnesses they are is just to carry it at home to their parents or their grandparents. That's where, that's where the danger is. Um, so a lot of the systems I've seen, a lot of colleges I've seen are going to have a hybrid system of in a combination of in-class and online, although they're going to have the choice of total online for those people who feel that they don't want to take the risk of, um, you know, going in class, but my, my experience in talking to people who've taken courses online is that they don't get the same satisfaction mm. or feel that they learn as much online as they do if they're in, in class and interacting with the teacher and their, or their other students. Dr. Ross, it seems like that there's really no way to truly be safe from this. If you're, if you're following the guidelines, yeah. if you're following the guidelines, um, even then, you could be exposed to someone who doesn't have symptoms, even if you're six feet away. Yeah. No, but if, if, if you are six feet away, unless they're coughing right on your face, I mean, usually the virus is not going to have that reach to you. So if you wash your hands and you wear your mask in public um, and you try to keep six feet away from people in general, mm -hmm. maybe from anybody who's really coughing, then you, you generally you're safe. Your, your risk is low. Mm. So those guidelines actually work, mm. and that's why our um, hospital system and, and ICUs were not overrun, uh, you know, to overcapacity and running out of equipment, um, you know, f for people. What about little kids? You know, hugging is so important, you know, and, and they, are they supposed to be six feet away or because they might be better off if you let them in a playground or you've got these overbearing parents who don't talk to this one, don't talk to that one. What, well, what do you think I mean, that? The kids are not very much at risk themselves for getting sick as much as bringing it home. So if they have young parents who are in their 40s or something, um, even if they bring it home, the chances are no one's going to die. The problem is with grandparents, because I have grandparents asking me all the time, you know, should I see my grandkids? Or if someone has a place, uh, a vacation home, you know, should I have my grandkids down? Yeah. So that's a, that's a t So usually, I will recommend that they they have the kids get COVID tests. If yeah. they if, if they want to hug them, the kids could have COVID tests, which aren't that bad. I mean, they now have a little swab that you can you put up a, a little bit up your nose, not all the way in the back, to a certain line. And you just go around a little bit, and then you put in and give it to someone to put in the container. You can get an answer in about five minutes. Yeah. And if someone if someone is negative, then 
you know, the, the kid can go and um, you, you can have spend some time together. Also, hey, we didn't get, oh, did, did get tested. <clears throat> um, I think some of the CVS clinics and um, oh, there's one, there's a place, yeah, there's some CVS clinics. I, I think um, Good Samaritan has one of the rapid systems. Yeah, they have a lot of drive-through ones too, and they'll probably get more. But um, what about the cures? There's all kinds of places. We would, would it, tell us about the cures because a few months ago there were no cures and nobody was doing them. And now somebody uh, said to me this morning, uh, invest in the stocks. There's a lot of companies out there and their stock is going from 2 to 12. And this, uh, any, any feedback about stocks at this point? I mean, not stocks, but um, cures, etc. Just this morning, I read a uh, an article for for doctors about um, the state of testing of different drugs, and there are, are there are two hundred and eighty nine different drugs that are being tested. Oh boy! By different, you know, everything from drugs that are already existing to drugs that you have to make using the sophisticated, you know, genetic techniques that the the biogens and the amgens and those places will do. So. Right now, there is not a definitive treatment. Like, remember, HIV, when it was around, mm. it first came out. I mean, how many years did people die on, needlessly? I mean, it was in such a tragedy, all, especially all the, um, the stars and the, and, and the celebrities mm. were dying left and right. There was nothing that you could do. Mm. And then finally, I think it was a medical student that came up with the idea of, why don't we combine two or three things together and see how it works? And so they put together two or three things that work partially good. And now HIV is turned into a chronic disease. Nobody dies as much from that anymore. Oh, yeah. Mm. You know? Yeah. So it's not cured and there's no vaccine for it. How are we doing with finding vaccines? I know there's been some development on that front. Yeah, well, they've shown that um, in chimpanzees, they've been able to to. to uh, induce immunity with vaccines, and then when they rechallenge them with the, with the virus, they were immune. Mm -hmm. so, so it is promising, and because of um, both economics and politics, there's a race between Europe, China, and the United States to develop the first good vaccines, and also they're not waiting like they did in the past to wait until the vaccine is ready and then develop the processing to make it because, you know, you can make a little something in the laboratory, but then to build it into uh, a manufacturing facility um, is pretty difficult. Mm -hmm. So um, what they've done is they've, they've given billions of dollars to some of the pharmaceutical companies to start building the factories to make the vaccine, even though they don't have the vaccine yet. Mm -hmm. guessing that the vaccine would be based on a certain formula or a molecular formula. And um, so, I don't know, I, I guess it, it's a matter of belief, but I, I am optimistic that by the end of the year they'll have a, a vaccine. We have, but, I don't know if you heard of uh, Scotty, Scotty Efron, he doesn't mind us using his name, but he was actually dying and he had three days to live and they approached him and said, look, you're dying anyway. This, you want to be part of this test case. What was it? Gilead, G-I-L-E-A-D? Yeah, Gilead, yeah. Yeah, and what is it? Rascal something or other. Well, yeah. anyway, in one day, all I got to tell you is three days later, he was discharged from the hospital, absolutely cured. He didn't need his oxygen tank. It was covered on the news. They were applauding him and everything. He's, he had saved his life. It's some drug with an R, but I don't know. Ram Desimir, I guess. Yeah. 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 Well, let's see, but the problem, that's like, that's, those are, those are anecdotal stories, just like we had the hydro, hydroxyquinone stories in France, where the, the doctor said he had 100 patients and he gave them the medication and they all, you know, they all improved. Mm. There's experimental bias and then... <clears throat> there are unusual cases where people would have recovered anyway. So you can't use one or two stories. It's, it's not a scientific thing. Yes. You have to do the, what's called the, the double blind crossover study where 
There's the sugar pill and then there's the real pill and nobody knows who gets what pill and the doctors don't know and you follow a, uh, you know, whether someone gets better or someone passes on and then you break the code and only the computer knows. <laughs> if, they see, if they see a trend like it's really working and statistically significant, they'll break the code and stop the, um, uh, the experiment and that's what they did with the uh, Gilead uh, product. But it only helped it's like the, 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 it didn't cure. What you need is you need two or three medicines, like you, in my opinion right now, you're going to need two or three medicines like they use for HIV to attack the virus from three different places and stop it until you finally find a, a vaccine or, or a real killer for the virus. You know, I've, I've read a lot too about people who have been on ventilators and there are residual effects that they are having where people, this is an extreme case, but there was one fellow who was an attorney and he had been on a ventilator. Fortunately, he recovered uh, and is still alive, but he can't function in his regular practice any longer. His mind, his cognitive skills have been impaired by the ventilator and now he's not able to function as a lawyer anymore. And I've heard more cases like this yeah, well, I don't, it's the virus that's affecting the brain. So you get, they're getting encephalitis. Oh. That is recognized unless you do an MRI of the brain. And I, I think there was some, I read an article that advertising a little portable MRI machine to, to do brain analysis for people who are in ICUs. Oh. Because it's very difficult. You know, if you're, if you're in the ICU and you get tubes all over you and, and tubes into you and you, you have to get an MRI. It's hard to get it to get to you all the way downstairs and several floors and all kinds of people that carry you and move you. And then, so they haven't been doing a lot of those MRIs. But but from what I read, some of the uh, convalescent morbidity we use that word is due to the virus attacking the heart and the virus attacking the brain and the virus attacking the kidney. Mm. Now the other thing that happens is. This virus causes a lot of pneumonia, and after the inflammation, you know, when you get a cut, and your cut heals, what's sometimes left? Scar yeah. tissue, right? Scar tissue, right? Yeah. So there actually is a disease called um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Idiopathic meaning we don't understand what happens. And there's another scarring lung disease called sarcoidosis, which causes scarring of the lungs. And happens in people for reasons we don't understand where they just become short of breath over a period of time. And then you do a chest x-ray and all of a sudden you find out their lungs are scarred. Hmm. And you try to treat them with prednisone and other things. And like any other disease, some of it's a minor hmm. thing. Some things are very debilitating. And people have to go on oxygen. And after seeing what this SARS virus does, it makes me feel that a lot of these idiopathic scarring diseases of the lung are really due to SARS type of viruses that get into people that are relatively asymptomatic from the point of view of colds and coughing, but just go firing. I, th I think we have to wind up soon. We do. It's a, there's about a minute left. But but it, it's so interesting. I can't believe it went by so fast. I know. I it's it. The major thing I wanted to just say is, despite what some people say, even some doctors, I personally feel it's extremely important in public when you're not with the family that you're with all the time to wear a mask because in one case it prevents the person who has it from spreading it to somebody else in the other case if you have an n95 mask it will filter out some but maybe not all of the germs that are sprayed on you but the, the few germs that you get the less sick you get mm -hmm. so you carry a carrier, what is it? Have a carry, don't carry a big stick, carry a big can of Lysol. <laughs> yeah, don't go. I just, yeah, just as props, I brought this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> everything gets sprayed with this. And then oh. everything yeah, with I got those. Yeah. <laughs> That's a, this is going to have to be a wrap. Yes, it's a it's been great. Thank you, Dr. Ross. It's been, it's been great to have you, as always. You're wonderful. We'll have you come back again because things will be changing. Excuse me, I have to shut the... Uh, See, the I got a built-in timer. <laughs> <laughs> but I couldn't, you know, I, I said to myself, it's time, but it can't be. It's just too fast. All right. 
Well, thank you again, Dr. Ross, and thank you to our viewers for watching. This is a continuing series, and every day we learn something new, and that's why we're fortunate right. to have Dr. Ross in our midst. And please let us know if you have any questions about this or any other topics, because remember, this is your show, The Law, Your Money, and You. And you, and you, and you.